The Lord saith, I think thoughts of peace and not of affliction. You shall call upon me and I will hear you, and I will bring back your captivity from all places. The introit, words from the introit this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Two Sundays ago, we addressed the clear and present danger we all face, namely that there's a revolution going on. Due to the complexity of the subject matter, I had to leave an important part of that sermon for today. So let us begin by reviewing a few things about revolution. Revolutions are revolting things. They're disgusting. They're revolting things. They disgust God. They are rebellions against the established or legitimate order. This established order is either directly willed by God, such as we find in his holy Roman Catholic Church, which is hierarchically arranged. And oftentimes it's even found in various kingdoms like that of France during the time of St. Joan of Arc. Or this order has been permitted by God. So it's either directly willed or permitted. And it's permitted in many, if not all, of today's revolutionary republics that we currently live under. St. Paul says, Let every soul be subject to higher powers, for there is no power but from God, and those that are, are ordained by God. Once again, as hard as it is for some to hear our own republic, the United States of America is a revolutionary republic. Although the USA claims to be one nation under God, it has nevertheless, from the very beginning, not recognized God's rights. What rights are these? Well, to mention a few, to be a Christian nation, we must recognize God became man in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. None of our founding fathers, nor the government they formed, has ever done this in any official or direct way that I'm aware of. What does St. Paul say? If any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. St. Paul, what does St. John say? Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. If we deny the Son, can we say that we're one nation under the Father, who is God? Neither has our country recognized the continuation of his incarnation in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. What does St. Cyprian say? No one can have God as Father who does not have the Church as Mother. Our country has not recognized the holiness, the sacredness, of his holy name and does not make any mention of it in the Constitution. Thus, we can safely say from these things alone that this republic is a revolutionary republic from its very foundation. Historically, this is accurate since the United States is really a constitution or a continuation of the English Revolution under King Henry VIII. All of the philosophies, political theories, and Protestant groups present at our foundation came out of revolutionary, schismatic England. That's a fact. Besides, our republic is really showing her colors now with nearly total exclusion of everything Christian from the public life of the country. And with the public applause and even financial support of blasphemy while people run for cover when Muhammad's name is used poorly. We have art displays of blasphemy of Christ and his mother in our country. With the demise of Sunday as the day of the Lord, with the insistence that the church support or fund intrinsically evil policies and actions like using contraception and abortion-causing chemicals, with the legalization of many things that are crimes crying to heaven for vengeance, Now, is this just the current administration caused by one party? Or rather, is this not the normal progression of the revolution? Revolutionaries are progressives. 
And they are always progressing, whether knowingly or unknowingly, goaded on by the devil to destroy the church and her holy laws. Why? Because the church always stands in the way of the revolution of what they call progress. Progressives want total independence from God, his church, and his laws. They want to do it their way. Thus, we noted that there are no good revolutions and no good revolutionaries. They're disgusting things. The good thing is to be a counter-revolutionary. Seeking to restore God's rights and his order. We also concluded with St. Paul that revolutionary times are dangerous times. Dangerous because souls are in grave peril of being eternally lost in the revolutionary culture that is so appealing to our fallen nature. And so popular that many cannot see what is wrong with it. Hell is the headquarters of the revolution. Hell is the place where all revolutions end. And hell is the place where demons and men make eternal atonement for gravely opposing God's established order. That's what they're doing down there. Making eternal atonement for his fighting God's established order. The more grave the resistance and the rebellion, the more grave the atonement, the deeper they are in hell. Now, some have rightly wondered when we can fight back. What about the Cristeros, Father? What about the Vondeans? Were they not good revolutionaries? No. They were good counter-revolutionaries. They were not revolutionaries. They were not revolting, but seeking to preserve or reestablish the Christian order that God has willed. Let us spend the rest of our time seeing how this works. Now, we could easily find much to consider in the scriptures, especially in the books of the Maccabees. But I would like to start with St. Joan of Arc. And there's a reason for this. I hope you will see by the time we're finished. King Henry V of England resumed the Hundred Years' War in 1415, thinking he and his successors had the legitimate claim to the throne of France. Ours is the God-given right, is what they were saying. He then waged war against the French and committed many brutalities and atrocities in the process of taking over nearly all of France's major cities and capital. It was not God's will, however, that France should be lost to the English, who themselves were soon to revolt from God and break completely from his holy church under King Henry VIII. Thus, to reestablish the proper order in France, God raised up the little French virgin, St. Joan of Arc. And this was not done heretofore, and it has not been done since. There's something special going on here. Something very special. She was born in Domremy, a town named after the great bishop and St. Domremigius. It was he who baptized Clovis, the first Catholic king of France, making France the eldest daughter of the church. Of interest here is how St. Joan of Arc and the French proceeded with God's plan to reestablish the proper and legitimate order of the French kings. First, St. Joan, after being called by God, worked many signs. Among them, she helped the crown prince, the Dauphin Charles, resolve some deep doubts about his legitimate claim to the throne, all by God's special revelation. Second, the Holy Roman Catholic Church examined and verified her calling through an assembly of authorized bishops and theologians. Third, the proper civil authorities made St. Joan the general of the French army when she quickly put in order. How did she do this? She had them adhere to God's established order. She's a counter-revolutionary, a model counter-revolutionary. What did they do? They went to confession, all of them. They all went to daily mass. They dismissed the women camp followers who were up to no good, and blasphemy was ended. So, we see that St. Joan, St. Joan was approved by the properly established authorities of both church and state. 
She then led the French to incredible military victories over the English. Remember, she's 17 years old, 18. There's never been a general like her. Something special going on here. So she led the French to incredible military victories over the English, such that the Dauphin could be crowned in the traditional French way at the cathedral in Reims. And the very place where St. Remigius had baptized and anointed Clovis, the first king of France. The result, even though St. Joan was put to a terrible death by the English in 1431, it was very unjust. It was revolutionary. The Hundred Years' War ended in 1453. The very year that Constantinople fell to the Muslims and the Russians split definitively from Rome, calling themselves the Third Rome. Keep this in mind. There seems to be a mystery here that I hope to shine some light upon in a moment. Soon the error of Russia, schism, was taken up by King Henry VIII. He too split away and made his own national church, the Anglicans. Historically, this split has enabled the Protestant revolution to keep going and to spread and maintain itself throughout the world. That's how serious it is. During the time of the split, many revolting things happened in England, including the looting and suppression of the monasteries and convents, the suppression of the clergy, and all things Catholic. Shortly after this time, some good men of Lincolnshire and York rose up to preserve God's established order in their beloved homeland. Now, this rising is called the Pilgrimage of Grace. You can look it up. The pilgrimage of grace and is typical of what would law later follow in the Vendée under the French Revolution and the Cristeros under the Mexican Communist Freemasonic Revolution. Each of these counter revolutionary movements were authentically Roman Catholic. They each displayed Catholic banners. The standard of St. Joan had the names of Jesus and Mary on it with a picture of Christ the King with two angels. The pilgrimage of grace had a banner with the five holy wounds and the sacred heart with chalice. The Vendée wore sacred heart badges on their clothes. The Cristeros had a banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe with the saying, Viva Cristo Rey. All of these counter-revolutionaries sought complete adherence to God's established order found in his holy Roman Catholic Church. So how did they know when it was right to rise up and fight back? The church herself answers this question. She teaches armed resistance to oppression by political authority is not legitimate unless all the following conditions are met. Number one, there is a certain grave and prolonged violation of fundamental rights. Number two, all other means of redress have been exhausted. Number three, such resistance will not provoke worse disorders. Number four, there is well-founded hope of success. And number five, it is impossible reasonably to foresee any better solution. Okay, let's look at each of these with a little help from Pope Pius XI. Why do I turn to him? Because he wrote of this very problem in three encyclical letters about the Cristero War and the persecutions in Mexico. What he taught there basically applies to what happened in all the situations we have mentioned, the pilgrimage of grace and the Vendée. The first danger to avoid here, remember, this is very important. The first danger to avoid is not becoming a revolutionary ourselves in fighting revolution. Listen to Pope Pius XI. The church protects peace and order even at the cost of grave sacrifices. And it condemns every unjust insurrection or violence against the constituted powers. We're not allowed to unjustly rise up. Pope Gregory XVI, back during the French, one of the French revolutions, wrote, We have learned that certain teachings are being spread among the common people in writings which attack the trust and submission due to princes. The torches of treason are being lit everywhere. Care must be taken lest the people being deceived are led away from the straight path. 
may all recall, according to the admonition of the apostle, that there is no authority except from God. What authority there is has been appointed by God. Therefore, he who resists authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist bring on themselves condemnation. Those are words from St. Paul. Pope Gregory goes on. Therefore, both divine and human laws cry out against those who strive by treason and sedition to drive the people from confidence in their princes and force them from their government. What is he saying? We're not allowed to become revolutionaries ourselves. What's he saying? All revolutions end in hell. Now, on the other hand, Pope Pius XI teaches, whenever these powers arise against justice and truth, even to destroying the very foundations of authority, those citizens are not to be condemned who unite to defend themselves and the nation by licit and appropriate means against those who make use of public power to bring it to ruin. What's he saying? We can fight back. When it becomes certain conditions are met, we can fight back. We can be counter-revolutionaries, but only when these conditions are met. First condition. Once again, there's a certain grave and prolonged violation of fundamental rights. In each of the cases mentioned, the violations against the church and her faithful priests and lay folk went on for some months and years before the counter-revolutionary movement formed to confront them. The pilgrimage of grace, the Vendée, the Cristeros, it went on. They finally rose up and fought back. Pope Pius XI himself listed some of the grave evils in Mexico. Among other things, the suppression of the clergy, grave sacrileges, destruction of churches and convents, violating and killing of their occupants. But he also noted it wasn't just against the church. Here are his words. He says, realize that the persecution of Mexico, besides being an outrage against God, against his church, and against the conscience of a Catholic people, is also an incentive to the subversion of the social order. They were destroying the social fabric of Mexico. So the first condition was easily met. Second condition, all other means of redress have been exhausted. Well, it's known that all attempts to stop the evil were ignored or punished. Pope Pius in 1926 wrote, there existed no hope or possibility or relief from the sad and unjust conditions under which the Catholic religion exists today in Mexico, except it be by special act of divine mercy. Now, if you don't know, the United States of America, one nation under God, was supporting the revolutionaries, not the Cristeros. That shows you this is a revolutionary country. Third stipulation. The resistance will not provoke worse disorders. It's hard to imagine for man to imagine anything worse than the damnation of a soul or of the loss of the church in a whole country where thousands upon thousands of souls will be lost without her presence. Post-Christian countries are always worse, much worse than the barbarian nations that preceded them. Schismatic Russia and England have spread their errors worldwide to the incalculable loss of souls. Furthermore, in each of the cases we listed, the counter-revolutionary movements always used proportionate and reasonable force to resist. There were no atrocities on the part of the counter-revolutionaries. This stipulation was met. Fourth stipulation. There's a well-founded hope of success. In each case... The counter-revolution had greater dedication than their opponents, even though they were rarely as well armed. In each case, amazingly, as with St. Joan of Arc, they reached a point where they would have won everything if they would have pressed the matter. But for some mysterious reason, some of which, as I said, are mysterious, they failed. So for various reasons, some of which are mysterious, they all failed. And like St. Joan, after they failed, the revolutionaries 
all but completely were exterminated by the revolutionaries, often even women and children. In such cases, I'm reminded of a line from St. Alphonsus Liguri, we can only adore in silence the secret judgments of God. I hope to break this silence in a little moment. In any case, they did have supernatural success. Many of them are now beatified. Fifth and final stipulation. It is impossible reasonably to foresee any better solution. Revolutionaries are progressives. They have a disdain for all things Catholic. Once they've gained some point of progress over the church, they do not turn back easily. Thus, Pope Pius XI indicated the stipulation was fulfilled when he wrote, Whereas other governments in recent times have been eager to renew agreements with the Holy See, that of Mexico frustrated every attempt to arrive at an understanding. On the contrary, it most unexpectedly broke the promises made to us shortly before in writing, banishing repeatedly our representatives and showing thereby its animosity against the church. Pope Pius also noted that they made all their evils legal. How long has Roe v. Wade been in effect in our country? For 40 years. Have we been able to overturn it? This stipulation was fulfilled. It's impossible reasonably to foresee a better situation, a better solution. So, did these counter-revolutionaries do well in taking up arms? Yes. The stipulations were fulfilled. They had every right to preserve God's Christian order. They acted rightly. Now, why did they fail then? It's mysterious. Here's one possible reason. They were true Catholics. They were true revolutionary, counter-revolutionaries. They struggled, in other words, when they came up against what appeared, at least on the surface, to be legitimately established authority. They didn't want to go against God's will. Once peace was offered and held out by the revolutionaries, they tried to work something out. They didn't press the matter. Not surprisingly, the revolution then turned on them, as Pope Pius XI noted. Even after putting it in writing, they turned on them. Here then is the main reason they failed. They themselves did not have a king. They didn't have a fully established government, a kingdom. St. Joan of Arc had a king, but he was weak and pusillanimous, and Joan could not make him press on to complete victory, even though it was sitting right in front of him. Yet this lack of a great king will not always be the case. That is the key to these uprisings. They are hints about how the revolution that is currently reigning supreme will come to an end. At some point, the revolution will begin to break down when we've had our fill of it, when it's practically destroyed us, and then there will be a more widespread counter-revolution. But this time, the prophecies of a great king will be finally fulfilled. This time, the counter-revolution will have its king, a king who will be a type, an image of Christ, the king of kings. The prophecies, many of them from great saints, say he will come from France and will be legitimately established by a great pope. And together, they will overcome the current revolution in every way. It must be utterly vanquished. So St. Joan was like a type, a faint hint or a big hint of this future reality. In some sense, this means that St. Joan of Arc is one bookend to this current revolution. The great king and the pope will be the other. Just as St. Joan's efforts and her very life led to the preservation of France from schismatic England, so also all the blood and effort of the valiant counter-revolutionaries since then will pay off in the conversion of Russia 
in her reunion with the Pope, in the reestablishment of a divinely ordained monarchy out of France, a holy Roman emperor, and in ending the revolutionary republics such that all the schisms and heretical sects will fail. It sounds too incredible, but it will happen. Scripture will be fulfilled. There will be only one flock and one shepherd, and all nations will adore the Christ, as the scriptures say, even physically. Until that time, any further counter-revolutionary movements similar to the Cristeros, the Vandanes, or the Pilgrimage of Grace will surely end in the same manner filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ in his church and martyrdom until the great king does come. Using a scriptural image, Moses' first attempt to free Israel from the Egyptians failed. It was a feeble attempt. But when God commissioned Moses, giving him power and authority, he went down to Egypt and he brought out the whole people and despoiled the Egyptians. Let us always strive to be counter-revolutionaries without ever embracing anything of the revolution. God will use us to bring about much good and prepare the way for the great Pope and the great King who are sure to come and reestablish God's holy order in a marvelous way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.